thank you, Paddy. Thank you, Web Summit, for assembling this marvelous panel. Um, we have about 18 minutes to solve pretty much every pressing problem facing the world today. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm Tom Nuttall from The Economist magazine, and I'm joined here by Jose Manuel Barroso, who was president of the European Commission for 10 years and a former prime minister of Portugal. We also have Roberto Azevedo, who is the Director General of the World Trade Organization since 2013, who I think has just put in a bid for a second term, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and to my right is Mohand Lukatov, who was the President of the UN General Assembly for its 70th term until September, and is also an MP in the Danish Parliament. Um, José Manuel, I'm going to begin with you. Um, the European Union is perhaps the most successful example of transnational cooperation the world has ever known, both broad and deep. But now, after years of challenges, financial challenges, the Eurozone crisis that um, was raging when you were in charge of the Commission, security, migration, it seems impossible, it seems unable to pull itself away from this continual crisis management. And a lot of people are now asking if the process of European integration, which has advanced with such extraordinary successes since the 1950s, is now finally coming to an end. And Brexit, of course, has accentuated that question. So can you give us your thoughts on that? What is the future of the EU? And are we about to enter a new phase in which the watchword is not going to be integration, but fracturing? Thank you. First of all, uh, now I speak completely freely. I'm no longer in a, an official capacity, so let's say that my level of sincerity is increasing day by day. <laughs> I can give you my opinion completely free. During these 10 years I was leading the European Commission, as you said, we had a lot of crises. But at the end, the European Union was able to show its resilience. I heard everybody predicting the decline of the euro, the implosion of the euro, Greece leaving the euro, but Greece is still with us in the euro. So I really believe, based on my experience, that the European Union is more resilient, is stronger than what usually people are able to recognize. Today, because of what I call the intellectual glamour of pessimism, people like to predict the worst. I believe Europe is stronger. Having said that, it's true that we have today new challenges. A very important challenge was, of course, the consequence of Brexit. Britain is one of the most important countries in Europe and in the world. And the fact that the British people voted to leave the European Union is certainly a very bad news, I believe, for Europe and for the perception of Europe in the world. We also have the problem of illegal migration and refugees that is giving a boost to nationalistic forces, to sometimes xenophobic forces, to protectionist forces, to what some people call nativist forces. But there, that's the general point I'd like to discuss, if possible, tonight. This is not only a problem with Europe. We are seeing all over the world a backlash against globalization, against trade, for instance. We are seeing protectionism from the vote in Valonia, in Belgium, against an agreement with Canada that was blocking agreement between Europe and Canada to the positions of the candidates in the United States election against trade with the Pacific region, we are today seeing a backlash against globalization. And I believe it's very important that Europe keeps a position of defending open societies, open economies, open information and digital economy, where, by the way, I believe Europe has a great potential, namely the human capital in Europe. We are behind America on that matter. The United States are clear above us. But if you look at the financing of digital economy, technology in the media, we are seeing that Europe is growing exponentially. And while apparently the Americans have reached some, somehow a peak, Europe is growing. And I believe that the great human capital of Europe, this great diversity, if there are not resistance at national level, 
that uh, can block the digital market, I believe Europe has still a very strong um, word to say. So there is a silent revolution going on in Europe in young people for more openness. But frankly speaking, we are now in a very existential fight globally between the forces of openness and the forces of nationalism, protectionism, chauvinism, as we see in the American elections. The result of the American election is going to be extremely important for those who want open societies and open economies. And I believe that in spite of its difficulties, Europe will show once again its resilience. Well, thank you for that. Um... Thank you. Thank you for that bracing antidote to glamorous pessimism. Um, Roberto, if I can turn to you. Um, trade, as José Manuel was saying, is suddenly politically sexy again, but not really for a very good reason. Um, it's a hot potato in Europe. As we heard, it's, an ex it's been an extremely hot potato during the American presidential campaign. We have very strong protectionist noises emanating from one political candidate. We have another candidate who wants to change the subject whenever trade is mentioned. TPP is floundering. TTIP's on life support. As you mentioned, the EU-Canada deal was nearly uh, thwarted by a bunch of Walloons in Belgium. Why is this happening now, and what can we do about it? I think, well, first of all, we, we have a problem, and I think it's clearly out there. And the problem is that today in the marketplace, uh, there are uh, feelings of uncertainty, uh, feelings of uh, being abandoned, to, uh, feelings of being left behind, and a sense of uh, not enough opportunities out there. Uh, if you're young, if you're 20, 30 years old, it's one thing. If you're late 40s, 50, and you lose your job, what do you do next? What, what's out there in the marketplace for you? How do you support your family? Where do you go from there? And, and I think that a lot of this uh, blame on trade is just finding the easy target, finding the easy enemy. It's the, it's the foreign. It's the different. It's what's coming from outside. Uh, it's unfair. Uh, uh, trade, um, it, but really, if we're honest with each other and if we look at the marketplace and we know what's happening, it has nothing to do with trade. Uh, two in ten jobs that are lost in advanced economies today are due to trade and to imports. Eight out of ten or more, it's about new technologies. It's about uh, uh, higher productivity, innovation. And those things, you cannot fight them. You, don't, you cannot be against them. You have to embrace them. You have to see that that is the future and adapt and be ready for that. So today, for example, how, what are you going to do when you have a full-scale delivery of um, parcels and things like that by drones? Or when you have uh, trucks, self-driven trucks delivering cargoes? And they already are doing that. I just saw a piece the other day on the newspaper about uh, beer being delivered by uh, self-driven trucks. Now, in the U.S. alone, there are three and a half million truck drivers. Well, those guys are going to do their jobs, and that's not only them. It's all the roadside assistants, hotels, cafes, restaurants, service stations. What are you going to do with all those people? Now, don't tell me a few years from now that they didn't know that this was going to happen. This is going to happen. And what do you do? How do you handle that? Now, if you don't realize what the problem is, you, will, you prescribe the wrong medicine. And the wrong medicine is protectionism, is, is stopping trade. What will happen if you do that? First of all, you smother the chances of thousands of people like the ones here in this hall who are young, who, who want to entrepreneur, who want to connect, who want to do business. That's what we have to do. We have to offer opportunity for them. But we also have to find ways of supporting those who, who are being left behind. And there are many that are being left behind. And that requires strong domestic policy, introspective, introspective thinking, and finding solutions for all those people. And that's not easy. That's not trade. Trade is not the monster. It's, it's not a panacea either. We have to do better than that. But you're making a persuasive case. But but there don't seem to be very many politicians out there who are prepared to make the case that you're making. Why is that? I think uh, there is a lot of emotion in this conversation, uh, particularly in, in campaigns and, and in other sets of 
of situations where politicians tend to respond to the public. They tend to respond to the, e give the easy answer. They don't want to give a complicated answer, an answer that goes, where you have to reform the whole system of education, training, skills, uh, offering opportunity for small entrepreneurs, financing, investment for them, for the small ones. It's much easier to say, oh, it's an import from that country over there. We all know who they are. So it's, it's their fault. You know, they have cheap labor, they don't, don't respect the environment, etc. Et it's much easier to point the finger in that direction. But that is not going to do it. I want to turn to you, Moans. I want to ask you about the future of global collaboration. <coughs> the United Nations is the, the forum par excellence for this, or it has been. Um, in some respects, we see some good news stories. We see the Paris Agreement on climate change. We see the, uh, the sustainable development goals. But when it comes to those hard issues, and in here I'm particularly thinking of Syria, where the Security Council has utterly failed to find any sort of solution to that, and the return of great power politics, an increasingly assertive Russia, an increasingly assertive China, an America that seems uncertain about its place in the world, the story there doesn't look so happy at all. So can you give us your views on what you think the role of the UN might be in helping to mediate those differences between those emerging great powers? First of all, I think that the United Nations will have better uh, possibilities of, of uh, joining uh, the forces for peace with the new Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, who is starting here <laughs> at New Year. That was the best man for the job. But the United Nations will never be stronger than the membership would allow them to be. And I, I see a lot of troubles uh, ahead of us with all the conflicts and humanitarian catastrophes still going on and big powers not joining hands to end them. But, as you said, on the other side of, 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 of the picture, you have a United Nations that in the past year, during my presidency, actually took decisions on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and uh, the Agreement on, on Climate, which has a lot to do also with the issues you are discussing this week here in Lisbon. Because if we should be able to make that huge transformation of our energy systems, our way of production and consumption, it will take not only tough, far-reaching political decisions and a stronger international cooperation, not a, a weaker one, which we see tendencies in Europe for right now, but it will also take that governments make the framework for the markets in incentives, taxations, and regulations that opens the way for those new innovative technologies in methods and products that are needed so urgently and is out there as tools existing or tools being developed within these next five years. We had a climate agreement. We had governments to commit to do something. We also know that's not enough, but what we hope and what we think is possible is that within these next four or five years, more political commitment and more innovation from you will create the full answer to how to implement the climate agreement, including a lot more of investment from government and private uh, investors uh, in this transformation, because without this cooperation, this partnership, we will never do it. Thank you. Um, in the We've, we only have a few minutes left. There's a, I think there's a common thread running through the answers that you all gave, and that is the, the inability or the unwillingness of some of our elected politicians to deliver hard truths to their electorate and to prepare them for mm -hmm. some of the difficulties to come. And that makes me worry because it makes me think we have a lot of disruptive technologies in the pipeline. Artificial intelligence, increasing mechanization, drones, self-driving cars, you name it. We're going to see, and you mentioned this in your, in your interventions, we're going to see very strong disruptive impacts on jobs, on trade, on economics. Are our politicians going to be strong enough and imaginative and creative enough to be able to prepare the electorate for these disruptive changes that are to come? We've got three minutes, so you get one each. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think that if the politicians should have the courage to take the right decisions quickly enough, it, we need a very strong civil society to push, and we need that big progressive business community out there who's actually asking, calling for the regulations, incentives, and taxation systems that will make it obvious for them to do the right things also for the long, uh, uh, the long perspective of humanity. I think we can do it, but I think we need much more pressure on politicians telling them that you know how to do it, and you want them to do it now. Roberta. Yeah. Well, I, I think politicians will get their way uh, as long as the electorate is responding to the easy answer. I mm -hmm. think at the end of the day, they have to be held accountable. And the people who can hold them accountable is the elector. And the, the voter, at the end of the day, has to not accept just the fact that blocking this here, the, the finding the easy solution is mm -hmm. going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. It requires most of the problems that we face today are structural changes in modern society. Mm -hmm. This is not going to change if the economy, a lot of the things I hear is, oh, the economy is going to pick up again. That's not going to change things. These are structural changes and you have to come to grips with that. And the political system has to respond to that. Now, how to do that is to hold them accountable. It's the electorate who has to inform themselves, have a more rational conversation about this, and say, look, this answer doesn't convince me. We need much more than that. And that's the first step. Yep. Okay. Yes, well? I, really believe, I really believe that uh, the missing variable is leadership. Because we are seeing, including in Europe, that uh, the leaders from the center-left to the center-right parties are giving up to the more extremist forces, including the very dark forces of nationalism. And we know in Europe what happened when nationalism was winning. We know that happened in this continent, the First and the Second World Wars. So I think we need leaders that explain to people that nationalism, chauvinism, is not the way forward. But one thing I know is that this transition that we are watching now is not driven by politicians. It's to a large extent driven by technology. So it is going on. There will be resistance. But globalization is going to happen with the will, the support or not of politicians. Of course, it will be great if the political leaders could try to have a human, a human the globalization, where we can defend some values, values that are dear for us in Europe, of human dignity, of human rights, of uh, social uh, care. But at the same time, the point cannot be to resist to the wave of globalization, because globalization is going to take place. So we need enlightened leadership, but I believe in democracy, and I believe the pressure of our civil societies is decisive for having this kind of enlightened and active leadership. Yeah. There you go. It's all in your hands. <laughs> you. That is all we have time for. Please join me in giving our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.